Bonjour, buenos dias, good morning, xin chao, ni hao, what's up? It's me, Mr. Jordan. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 14 of The Handmaid's Tale. We'll start with a brief recap and summary of chapter 14 from The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Off red, Serena, Rita, all of the women of the household gather in the sitting room and wait for the commander. Nick arrives, enters the room with the women, immediately stands too close to our narrator, Offred, making her uncomfortable, touches her foot, and then cracks a joke. They watch a news report on the television, and they learn about a Christian sect still fighting in the hills, and they're being smoked out near a city that was once Detroit. There's another flashback here, and this time the narrator goes to her and her partner, Luke, giving their child sleeping pills, packing the car, and then making a run for the border where they have to go through checkpoints with their passports. And we realize they're heading north to what was once Canada. Let's do an analysis and close reading of chapter 14. So there's this imagery here of the mirror, the convex distorted mirror that's the eye on the wall that's watching everything taking place in the sitting room spying, looking on. Remember, in Gilead, the spies are literally called eyes. So the eye of glass on the wall, the pendulum of the clock, as if I'm a piece of furniture, she says. No longer the sedentary woman on the d divan. Offred is feeling like she's being kept, polished, stored away, like a museum piece, right? She's one of these archaic pieces of furniture, objects collected. Just like the spoils of war, she's a token that's been taken and held captive. They're in this room surrounded by art, this collection, all of these things that are rummaged through and looked over. And it has the real feeling of a war where the victor takes the spoils, right? There was so much of this throughout Europe where paintings, jewels, gold, all of the goods were looted and taken by invading armies. So surrounded by this kind of plundering or stealing that the commander and their household has done, Offred has this sort of sudden urge to take something. She wants a possession too. And she starts to imagine in her head the different things that she could t tuck away and steal. This idea that she could bring something of her own up to her bedroom. She tells us she would take it out and look at it. It would make me feel like I have power. So she wants to have and to hold the same way that the commander has a household. She wants to hold on to something, to have the tactile grip in her hand. In this chapter, the narrator, Offred, also tells us that she pictures her name at night floating before her. So there's this image of her name as a kind of talisman or sort of like a magical apparition that appears before her. In other words, her name is something she still treasures, right? It's something they can't take from her, this knowledge of herself, of the identity she once had, just like her memories and her flashbacks, which she resorts to again and again when she doesn't want to exist in the present. There's also the double use of the double sort of image of the world here, where the sitting room is for anything but sitting, right? They're standing, they're waiting, they're watching the television, they're listening to the nightly news. They're interacting with each other in their stifled, repressed way. There's also this character on the nightly news of the anchorman who's wise and fatherly and patronizing. And he has this sort of slick sheen. And the image really recalls, I think, politicians of the time, right? I was writing in the early 80s. And I'm conjuring up this image of, you know, Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan or... Jerry Falwell Sr. preaching on Sunday mornings, this slick, smiley, perfect dental care. But we know that they're selling lies. We know that the news being told is not the truth. Or if it is a truth, it's only a certain version of the truth. The truth being disseminated through Gilead's propaganda. 